you hear me? Yes. That's all we want to notice here. Please stand with me for the reading of God's word and for prayer. Be reading Romans 3, chapter, um, verses 10 through 18. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no, none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have, have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Let us pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we come together as your people to hear from you. Lord, I can't preach anything, but you can preach all things. This is your word. Help me to step aside and help you to st step in and proclaim your truth and your word. Let everything said and done bring your name, glory, honor, and praise. Remind me of everything that you've given me to present to your people. And let it always glorify thy holy, righteous name. All this I pray in Christ's name. Amen. I had to do the mic check because, you know, I've been working on Zoom meetings and all that. And sometimes you forget you mute yourself and don't even have it on. You're doing all this talking and nobody can hear you. <laughs> I, I got this message, if you will, this sermon, because in the last couple of years, um, a lot of my family members have started just, you know, not going to church and just watching television television evangelist, if you will, you know, in if, fact, if one of them, I was talking to him and I say, well, why don't you go to church? He, he, he says, well, I get all the word of God that I need from pastor so-and-so who comes on at eight o'clock, pastor so-and-so come on at eight thirty, pastor so-and-so come on at nine o'clock. So, I mean, he's got his day scheduled that he's going to watch this person, that person, that person. So I just was thinking, what is the message he's hearing from the TV evangelist and the message that we hear on social, social media and all of that that's going out there. What is the gospel message they're, they're, they're presenting compared to what the word of God says? Now, the first thing I want to look at is what is the problem? Because we know that the word gospel means good news, right? Well, in order to understand the good news, you need to understand the bad news. Now, if you look at the text I just read, Paul paints a pretty bad picture of us, don't he? He really takes down our character. Notice in verse 10, it says, it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. You would think, like, like, there got to be somebody. But he said, no, not one. There is none who understand. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. He says we're unprofitable. We are worthless. If you were to take something, you know, if you will, you know, if you found, you know, you were cleaning up and you found something at home, you say, I wonder how much this is worth. You take it to the pawn shop and say, OK, how much is worth? And then they give you an assessment. They tell you how much it's worth and how much you can get for it. He's saying if you were to take us to the pawn shop, say, how much are they worth? Nothing. You got to pay me to take it. <laughs> we're worthless. I mean, he paints a very bad picture of us. It even ends, and it ends it in 18. They're saying there's none who fear God before their eyes. I mean, I'm sorry, there's no fear of God before their eyes. What is our problem? What is the world's problem? To get the answer, we must go to Romans chapter 1. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans 1, 18 through 25. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because they because what may be known of God in, is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible 
incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creepy things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who has changed the truth of God for, for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So we see the problem is us. God, the all-powerful, all-knowing, holy, righteous creator, who is worthy of all praise, honor, glory, and worship. And he's worthy to be obeyed. And we, the truth-suppressing, rebellious, fallen creatures, refuse to give him that honor and glory and praise that he is just due. So his wrath is upon us. Got to make sure the clicker's working too. <laughs> so we see the problem is we have a righteous debt to God. He, he is holy and we're not. We have a sin payment to God. Because he's holy and we're not and we fall short, we have sin that must be atoned for. And we have a destroyed relationship with God. He's holy, we're not. So we cannot be in relationship. There's a chasm, if you will, between us. Now, this passage also tells us a couple other things, too. Number one, we know that there's a problem because it says we suppress the truth. You ever get in the fight with your wife that came out of nowhere? I mean, you, you're sitting there, you think everything is going cool. Everything's going good. We got to, everything's going good. Then all of a sudden you said something and now we're in the fight. And you, you feel like you're blindsided. Like, where'd this come from? I thought everything was going good. But this passage is telling us we weren't blindsided. Not only do we know we're in the fight, we started it. Also, it's telling us we don't care. Because we want to take God off the throne and put ourselves up there. See, we really want autonomy from him. Remember verse 318? He said, there is no fear of God before their eyes. We do not want to give, give worship, praise, and honor to the one that it is due. We want to worship. We want the worship. We want the praise. And we want the honor. Now, I just want to point out some things that, it, that is not the main problem. These are things that social media, you can find this out there. The first four we'll go through. I need help to become the best version of myself. I'm okay, I just need some fine tuning. You'll find a lot of that out there. I don't love myself enough. I need help to accept myself. I need help to tap into my blessings. I need to find that key formula or that key that key thing to unlock the universe so I can get everything that I need and want. And I'm searching for God, but do not know how to find him. Now, these things, if you will, is, is trying to explain our incompleteness in ourselves, And we're trying to find ourselves, as we say. And we're, and, we're, and we're not really accepting how bad the Bible pictures us and tells us that we are. Number one, that one that I read there about, I need, to, I need help to become the best version of myself. Because of our sin, any version of ourself would not be pleasing to God. You've heard it said that God loves you as you are. No, God will accept you and God, and God can take you from where you are for wherever you are and make sudden of you. But God doesn't love us as we are. God hates us as we are because as we are, we're in sin. He hates us so much that he sent his son to redeem us. And then I, I, I don't love myself enough. Really, we love ourselves more than we love God. That is really the problem. I need help to tap into my blessings. We're not deserving of any blessings. Remember, his just wrath is upon us. And I'm searching for God, but do not know how to find him. No, we know where God is. We know how to find him, but we suppress that truth because we try to live this life as if he doesn't exist. Remember, we want ourselves up on the throne. Like I said, all of these, all of these things are just excuses for not trying to admit the truth about ourselves. Now, the next three, 
The next three are, you'll see, very popular, very now, with everything going on and all of that. I don't love my fellow man correctly. Now, this is a problem. We all will admit that we need to love one another more. But the question is, why don't we? And that, and that is not the main problem. I must love and support my family and country. Our family and country are under attack. You can just look at You can just look out there and see everything's even attacking this, this, um, this country over and over. Just look at the news media and all of that. You know, those who don't know me, I, um, I served 24 years in the Air Force. And um, I can remember one time I was getting deployed to the desert. I was with a friend of mine. We were on the plane on the way over there. And, you know, he turned around, he was crying. And I asked, I said, Rob, what's up? He said, I had a dream that, um, you know, I went over here and I died. And I turned to him, I said, well, number one, we're supply. <laughs> And those who don't know, supply is in the front lines. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, it has to get pretty bad if supply troops, you know, in the front line dying. <laughs> and number two, I asked them, I said, um, what'd you sign up for? If you're in the military, you got to know at some point you can be put in harm's way. And I asked them this. I said, um, isn't this country worth dying for? See, I believe it is. I really do. With the freedoms and opportunities that is given us by this country, it is worth dying for. But, so even the attacks on our country and our family and all of that, those are problems, but it's not the main problem. The last one I have that, I must eliminate all injustice in the world. You see a lot of stuff about social justice and all of that. Those who, don't, those who know me, um, know my testimony and know that um, my older brother was convicted and sentenced for in, you know, life in prison. And he spent 16 years in prison and died in prison. Those who don't know the whole story or I haven't shared it with, he actually s spent 16 years for a crime he didn't do. And he died for a crime he didn't do. He died in prison. You know. Now, as bad as that is, and there's some messed up stuff in this world that we need to work on. That's still not the main problem. Because the main problems is sin. All this other stuff is just symptoms of the main problem. We being born in Adam have a sinful nature. That is the problem. Our sinful heart. See, the problem with the world is not that there's something wrong with those people. The problem with the world is there's something wrong with me. Now we know the problem. Now we need to get to the good news. Let's go back to Romans 3, 19 through 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For, the law is, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. We see in verse 19, we stand guilty, silent before God. There's nothing that we can say because if we're honest with ourselves, even right now, we would say we're sinners. We deserve his just wrath if we're totally honest with ourselves. So at that moment, when we stand before God, all the pretense, all the, just, all the justifying this and that would be gone. And you just stand before him and you know, I am guilty. In verse 20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law exposes our sin. You know, I may look okay comparing myself to, you know, my fellow brother here or there. But when I compare myself to God's standard, I, I see how short I fall, fall and how I don't measure up. We see in these two verses that the answer to the problem is not in us. Then what is the answer? Christ is the answer. Christ is the good news. See, in Christ, we have righteousness in God's eyes. In Christ, we have no sin in God's eyes. In Christ, we have a relationship with God. The answer to our problem is Christ. Let's read Romans 3, 21 through 22. 
But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. See, God solves all our, Christ solves all our problems with God. Our first problem, right? We have a righteous debt due to God. In Christ, we have righteousness in God's eyes. See, in our own, we can't measure up to God's standard. You notice it says in verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short. You know, no matter how good you may think you are, right? You may think you got it going on and all of that. You're always going to fall short. It's like multiplying something by zero, if you will. If you did an equation, and no matter how big the numbers are and no matter how many numbers you, you use, once you, know, once you put in times zero, what's the answer? Zero. And with our sin, no matter how big of things we do, no matter how many we do, because of our sin, is zero. But look at verse 22. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus has perfect righteousness that is imputed to our account. Only in Christ can our debt to God be paid. Our second problem, we, we have a sin payment due to God. But we, but we see in verse 24 and 25, in Christ we have no sin in God's eyes, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Every sin must be atoned for. And either you're going to atone for it yourself in hell or Christ has, has atoned for it on the cross. Notice it says in verse 24, you, it used the word redemption. One of the definitions of the word redemption is the action of regaining of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. It's like having your car re repossessed because you didn't make the payments, and then, and then you go in there, you make the payment, and they give you back the car because you, you have satisfied the debt that was due. And it uses the word propitiation. That means to appeasement. Christ's blood satisfied our sin payment. It's like getting a receipt stamp paid in full. He appeased the Father's anger, the Father's wrath. Our third problem, we have a destroyed relationship with God. In Christ, we have a, re we have a relationship with God. Verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In Christ, our relationship with our creator is mended. Like I said, he's holy, he's righteous, and we're not. In Christ, we are mended back to God. It says here that God is the just and the justifier. He is just because he is holy and righteous, and every sin had to be atoned for. And every sin was atoned for. Like I say, either the people were atoned for it in hell themselves, or, or for us, it was atoned for on the cross. It was paid for. God being holy couldn't just wink at our sin and just go, I'm going to let you slide. It had to be atoned for. So he is just because the sin was atoned for. Christ, the second Adam, came and paid for our sins. He is the justifier because he's the one that gave the payment. Christ, God the Father sent the Son for salvation. God the Son accomplished salvation. And God the Holy Spirit applies salvation. It is by him. He is the justifier. Here's a little illustration of our imputation exchange with Christ. Christ got all of our sin and guilt and everything. And we took the benefits of his death and his life. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has commended to us the word of reconciliation. That hole that is in us, because we were separated from our creator, that incompleteness is we are made complete 
in Christ because we are made mended with our creator. In Christ, we are justified. We have right standing with God. We are complete. Now, that's a clear message, right? It told you the problem. The solution is Christ. Now, let's look at how it's been so, sometimes you know, distorted, right? Let's go back to um, Romans 3. First distortion. We distort, distort the gospel when we focus on our actions in the work of salvation. Notice verse 27. Where is, where is the boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? No, by the law of faith. Notice it asks us the question, where's the boasting? Because in the gospel, there's no room for boasting. I can't boast about anything because, you know, it's Christ's righteousness, not mine. I can't go like, look how great I was. It's Christ's payment for sin, not mine. There's nothing I can say my, for my sins. Christ paid for my sin. It's Christ that reunited me with God because it's because I'm in Christ that I'm united with God. I have nothing that I can boast about. But then some people will say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have faith. It's my faith, right? So even though Christ is doing all the heavy lifting, right? You know, I did the thing that the most, I did the thing that set it off. My faith is what set it off. So I have something I can pat myself on the back and give myself credit for. Because without, you know, without my faith, none of this even gets started. But turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Notice in verse 8, it says, saved by grace. It is the reason that we're saved, grace. Grace is unmerited favor. It is not something that you earn. And it says, through faith. Faith is the means that we come to God. But notice it says that this faith did not come from us. It is a gift from God. And notice also in verse 9, it also brings up again about having nothing to boast about. Now, if you look at this slide, I have two views, and they look of salvation. They look pretty similar, don't they? But there's one big difference that's at the top. The one I, you know, you got the one I call the God's center view, and you got the man's center view. In the God's center view, the first action is God working, regeneration. In the man's center view, the first action is man. See, in the God's center view, when we're presenting the gospel, when we're proclaiming his kingdom, we're focused on him and we're declaring him. That is the focus. In the man's center view, the focus is on man. And that is how somehow, sometimes, shall I say, some people have started distorting the gospel. Because since that's since in this view, in this economy, the first action is man. It's like God's hands are tied. And so we must get man to act. And since we must get man to act, some people have come to, how can I say, downplaying the gospel. You know, we have to make it more appealing to people. So you, you've, you've heard it before. They'll call it the positive gospel. Let's not talk about that sin thing. Let's not put that out there because nobody's going to come to church if you talk about sin. We got to talk about, let's focus on our, you know, our activities and our programs and this and that. We're going we're gonna to talk about all this other stuff because we got to make man act. In their mind, they feel no matter what I compromise with the gospel, as long as I get man to act, it's all good. The problem with this, this, this distorted gospel is that people may come to the church, but they may never come to Christ. And if you look at verse 1 in Ephesians 2, there it says what? We were dead. How can a dead man act? You know, I've taken some classes. I've taken speech classes. I know some of y'all say you need to take some more. But, that's <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the things they always say is know your audience. 
Can you imagine getting a speech ready to motivate the cemetery? Like, okay, 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 I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to say it this way, I'm going to say it that way. If everybody's dead, what are you going to motivate? <laughs> Remember what Jesus told Nicodemus in, in chapter, John chapter 3, verse 3? Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. See, unless God works and changes your heart, you cannot see the kingdom of God. God gives us spiritual life, then we see the kingdom, and then we come to the king. Before the spirit works, we would never turn to God. Now, the second distortion is up, uh, go, going back to um, Romans 3, verse 28. We distort the gospel by adding to Christ's works. I think it's down there. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to make everything fit. Therefore, we can conclude that man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Notice in verse 28 there, we are saved simply by trusting in Christ. We are saved by Christ alone, not by our works. Notice it said apart from the deeds of the law, apart from our works, apart from that. That's not even in the, in the equation. See, now we do do good works. But we do good works because we have God's love, not to get God's love. Now, I see two problems with this distortion of the gospel. Problem number one, people can have a false sense of, uh, of salvation, if you will, because they'll put their faith, if you will, in something that they have done and not in Christ. They say, well, I did this, I did that. You know, I went to Sunday school. I done that. I must be saved. I did my work. No. It's in Christ, in Christ alone. The other distortion I see that can come, uh, you know, wrong with this it, is that it can put Christians in bondage. If you look here, I have, you know, kind of a flow. I know this, this is not an all-inclusiveness of salvation. Just a good snapshot. <laughs> but if you look, I got justification and sanctification. Right? Justification is a one time deal. God, boom, He justified, He saves you, He places you in His family. Sanctification is an ongoing process of us growing in God. But, if, but sometimes people get it mixed up. And if, you, and if you're feeling that you have to do works to get justified before God, you, and, and, and then, like I say, sanctification is an ongoing process. And those, are, uh, those Christians, you know, we all know that it's an up and going. So we're going to have hills, we're going to have valleys, right? And sometimes you're in one of those valleys, and, you, and you're thinking, well, wait a minute. Maybe I didn't do the right work. Maybe I didn't do the right thing to get myself saved. So if you believe that you have to add something to it. See, while God may discipline us at times because we sin, you know, in the sanctification process, we're always secure. Why? Because we're secure in Christ. Because we're in Christ. Remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus in John 1, 29? The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He didn't say, with our help. Now, for our last distortion, please turn with me to Romans 11, verses 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who, who has become his counselor or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. This is the transitioning point of the book of Romans. Chapters one through 11, Paul is laying out God's great salvation and chapters 12 through 16, He's then going to start, he starts telling us how we should live in light of what, of God's great salvation. But notice the transition point. 
Notice what he says in verse 36. And he's saying this about God's great salvation. You know, for of, of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Everything is for God. Everything is for his glory, even our salvation. See, the last distortion is when we make our happiness the purpose for it all. Right? We make, we make God something like an investment, if you will. Come to God and all your cares will go away. Come to God and you're going to gain everything in the world. But everything is for his glory. And he may get his glory by saving us and taking us through suffering. You may have to suffer. He may get his glory by saving us and taking us through persecution. We may go through persecution. He may get his glory by saving us and having us be dirt poor. You may lose it all. He may get his glory by saving us and having us be healed and rich. Everybody said, that's the plan I want. <laughs> that's the one I want. But he may get his glory many different ways. If you look through the Bible, you'll see him getting his glory through many different people in different ways. I mean, if you look at Abraham and Solomon, You'd be like, man, that's pretty, they had it pretty good. That's, I like that. But then you look at Hosea, and then you look at Job. Remember what he told Hosea, right? You know, Hosea 1, 2 says, When the Lord began to speak uh, through, through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman, let me say that right, and have children with her like, like an adulterous wife. This land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So his calling was to go marry a woman that was going to be unfaithful to him. How many people are going to sign up for that? <laughs> but that was his calling. That's what God chose to get his glory through. And we know about Job. And what about Paul? You know, everybody, you know, the people that teach this whole thing about, you know, naming and claiming and all that, one of their big verses is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who gives me strength, right? I can all things, do all things through Christ, you know. But Paul, didn't he get beheaded? Did, wasn't he persecuted? See, we, we should be able to give God glory no matter what we go through. Remember I told you about my brother who was, went to prison for something he didn't do? He spent 16 years in prison and died in prison. Sounds like a horror story, don't it? It's pretty sad, but because of the circumstances of all of that, he came to Christ. His daughter came to Christ. I came to Christ. So as bad as that was, God still got glory. No matter how God cho chooses to get his glory through life, th I mean, through our life, we must praise him. See, I see two other big, I see two big problems with this. Number one, it could stunt our growth in Christ because it makes our focus and our desire this world. If you look at all the prosperity preachers and naming and claiming and faith healers and all this other stuff out there, they always focus on gaining what? This world. That's not our goal. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 13, um, 22? This is the parable of the sower. He said, if, if, as for what was sown among the thrones, th this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. The cares of this world, the, the desire of this world. This world is not our goal. Christ is our goal. God is, is, God is our end, not a means to an end. We must fall out of love with, with the world and fall more in love with Christ. Lamentations 3.24, the Lord is my portion. Says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The second problem I see with this gospel or this so-called gospel is to me it's an anti-gospel because it takes us right back to the problem remember i said the problem was we want to take 
God off the throne and put ourselves on the throne. And the way, and the way it's presented out there, it almost made God like our butler. You know, I did, I do this, I do that. I have enough faith, I did that. And then it's like I ring my bell and God, come on, give me my blessing. Come on, ding, 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 ding. You know, I did that. All right, God, come on, give me my blessing. God becomes subject to us. May it never be. He is sovereign. He is holy. He is worthy of all praise and honor. See? In, the, in that economy, in, in our minds, we have taken God off the throne and made him subject to us. So instead of the creator receiving glory, we, the creatures, are. Now, I want to end by us looking at 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. Because I figured, let's see how Paul presented the gospel. What was his focus? I mean, he wrote 13 books of the Bible. He might know something. And, and I, brother, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, Paul is a well-educated man, one of the most educated men of his time. And he said that he, you know, he came in only to say, Christ crucified. I mean, Paul was so educated, if he was around today, if, you, if he had an office, if you walked in there, you'll see all his degrees up on the wall. And like I say, if he wrote a book or something, in the back of the book, he'd be smoking a pipe, sitting up there, Dr. Paul. <laughs> and they have all his credentials and this and that. But he said, you know, he wanted to focus on Christ and him crucified. He could have came up with many ways to present the gospel and many things, but he only wanted to say Christ and him crucified. Because that is the gospel. That is the truth. That is what the world needs. Jesus is the gospel. Jesus is the good news. Let us pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, I pray that I presented your word. I pray that your name was lifted up. And I pray that your name was glorified. Let us never be ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Let us forever declare your truth and declare your name and forever praise you. All this I pray in Christ's name. Amen.